Hello, this is James Helm of Helm Enterprises Forging Division. Uh, today I'm not going to be talking about any of my stuff. Uh, I'm going to be talking about a couple of new products from Kershaw. I had a table recently at the Usual Suspects Network Gathering in Las Vegas. And at one point I was walking around the show looking at other people's tables and came across the Kershaw booth and saw these and I liked them. Uh, they intrigued me. And so after the show I ordered a couple. They just got here. I haven't done any cutting or anything. Uh, we're going to do a little bit of looking at them and then testing. Um, obviously, obviously I would prefer that you order a blade for me that I make. But if you're not going to do that, I think these are looking like they're going to be a real good tool for the money. And I'd rather you spend money on this than some other brand that people seem to be spending a lot of money buying that has a fairly poor reputation at this point. Let's take a look. What I bought are the Camp 18 and Camp 14 models. 18-inch um, blade, 14-inch blade. They also have a 10-inch model. That's more of a Kakuri style blade. I did not get one of those. Just didn't appeal to me and I could find out what I wanted to know from these two. Um, you know, they're different lengths, but they're also different blade designs. The handles are the same, but the blades are different. Um, these are not a typical machete. Machetes are usually pretty thin, fairly whippy. These have about a 3 16 inch spine on them, so they're stout. It's about what I would build um, my bush swords like. In spite of being that thick, though, they're pretty light and balanced. It's a full flat taper going from the spine down until the secondary bevel starts, which leaves a lot of strength and takes out a lot of weight. It's a good way of building a blade. I don't know why there aren't more production companies that do this. The Buck Hoodlum, same construction, um, but not a whole lot of factory knives, big knives that use that these days. The steel, I was told by the representative at the Kershaw booth, is something like a variation of plain medium carbon, like a 1060. Uh, don't hold me to that, but I'm pretty sure he said it was like a 1060. It's a Chinese version, but hopefully the quality is good. We're going to see as we test. Um, the edge is decently sharp. I haven't tried to cut anything with it yet. I don't believe it's quite hair shaving. Nope, it's not hair shaving. But that's a pretty sharp edge for for a machete, for a brush tool. It's close enough that it wouldn't take that much work on a whetstone and a strop to bring that up to shaving sharp. Uh, if you're curious how to do that, you don't already know, check out my sharpening videos. I show how I sharpen to shaving sharp. Um, so it's not shaving sharp, but it's it's a good working edge. The handles are well designed. Um, they have a little bit of drop to them, which drops the sweet spot for chopping on the blade down a little bit below the level of your knuckles, which is a good thing. It's a little more power. Um, it widens here at the end, which provides a mechanical lock in your hand to keep it from sliding out of your hand as you're chopping. It also widens here at the front, making a good mechanical forward lock. So if you have any kind of a forward motion with the blade, if you're this is pointy enough, you could stab with it. If you're doing that, your hand is not going to be sliding up. Um, it's a rubber rubber overmold on some kind of a hard plastic handle. It's a hidden tang, which here in a little bit we'll take the handle off and show you what it looks like underneath there. They did a good job with the tang. Um, it has a forward and aft lanyard hole. So a lot of the, especially competition cutting knives, 
these days use a forward lanyard hole, so you're less likely to have it go swinging around if you lose your grip and the lanyard catches it. Or you can do it both, or you can run some cord through and around your hand like that, if you want to go with that kind of lanyard. Or conversely, it's a good spot if you want to make a braided paracord D-guard like I've seen some people do. You can anchor it there, come around with your braid, and anchor it there and make yourself a flexible paracord D-guard. It's comfortable. Uh, the only thing I'll say is that the rubber and the checkering feel like they might could raise some hot spots if you're chopping a lot. I don't know yet. We'll see once I start cutting if it starts feeling uncomfortable. The shape itself is good. It may be a little bit much texture for how I prefer a handle. That being said, it's no different than, say, a cold steel machete handle with its checkering. It doesn't, it's not any rougher than that. Okay, with hidden tang knives, you always have a little bit of a question on did they build it right? Um, a lot of manufacturers, especially over in third world countries that are selling to the U.S., they'll skimp on materials with a hidden tang knife because you can't see it. It's hidden. So if they can shave one thousandth of a cent off their materials cost, they'll do it if they're unscrupulous, which a lot of them are. So we wanted to make sure that this had a good tang on it since we couldn't see it. And by doggies it does. The handle is held on with these what are called sex bolts. You have a male side and a female side. This particular one has a Torx head on it. And the handle is, looks like injection molded plastic with a rubber over the top. Slips on and then bolts in place. Nice and tight. I had to tug on it pretty hard to get it to come off. I'm going to point out what makes this a good hidden tang. For one thing, you've got a lot of steel here. It's not a spindly little stick. So there's a lot of mass. Notice that the transition going into the Ricasso is a very nice large arc. That looks like about a two inch radius arc. Square corners concentrate stress. That's why you never see airplane windows with square corners. They'll crack at that square. So putting a nice curve where you're meeting the blade with the tang spreads that stress out and makes it a much, much stronger transition. Another thing is the holes for the screws have plenty of steel on either side. And there's another big chopper that you can buy at Walmart for not much money that is notorious for the tangs breaking. And you look at the pictures of it and it has a hole that's almost at the edge of the tank. So it's a weak spot. It'll break. These are pretty much in the middle. This one's a little bit offset, but it's got a lot of steel on the side that it's closest to and even more on the other side, obviously. So the hole placement is good. The overall size of the tank is good. The transition is good. If you're going to do a hidden tank, this is the way to do it. You need to move. Okay. Okay, talk about the blades a little bit. Um, the longer one, the Camp 18, has a little bit of a drop to it, a very gentle recurve. This drop puts the uh, sweet spot for chopping a little bit below the level of your knuckles, making it a more powerful chop. Um, the bush swords that I make pretty much all have that drop to it. Uh, you go too far, like a, say how much recurve a kukuri has, and it tends to be harder to control. If you've ever chopped with a kukuri and you've uh, gotten off on your aim a little bit, you know it tends to try to twist on you. So a slider recurve gives you power without compromising too much on the controllability. So this is a nice amount of drop. Um, a tight recurve is kind of hard to sharpen on a flat wet rock also. This one is a gentle enough recurve that it's 
going to sharpen easily on a flat stone. Um, it's nice and long. It's fairly fairly wide blade, but it stays narrow enough that you don't get excessive weight in spite of its you know nice stout thick spine. They did a slight bevel on the upper edge right there, cutting down a little bit on weight. Um, both of them have a machined fuller. This is not a blood groove. It has nothing to do with blood. It's a way of making a thinner, stiffer blade. It's basically making an I-beam out of the blade. Um, the machining finish is kind of rough, but hey, this is a working blade. It's not a showpiece. So it works, it works out all right. Um, the shorter one, the Camp 14, also has a little bit of drop. Not as much. It gets most of its drop via the up sweep to the belly. The 18 drops down, the 14 sweeps up. A um, little bit different purpose, a little bit shorter. It's obviously a little lighter. It is a bit wider than the 18 blade is, I believe. A little bit wider. So they balance out to you know, overlapping the same kind of cutting, but each one's just a little bit better in one direction than the other. 14, uh, particularly, I can see you holding up here by the wide part and using for finer cutting down at the tip. Gives you a good area for your hand to hold and do finer ch cutting, doing rocking cuts, etc. Um, the balance on these is good. You know, I keep talking about the thick spine. This is much thicker than a machete typically is. It's not overly heavy. It moves fast. Even the 18. Weight-wise, there doesn't feel like too much difference between the two. The 18's a little bit, a little bit heavier, a little bit slower, but not by much. It's still a quick blade. It's not going to tire you out if you're working with it because of the weight. That being said, if you're whacking your way through tall grass like some of the uh, South American machetes are made to do, it's heavy enough. It's probably going to tire you out fairly quickly. But when you're cutting through brush heavier stuff like say mesquite trees like we have here in Texas that's a good appropriate weight for dealing with the smaller whippy stuff and also cutting through the larger limbs so you're getting a little bit of a trade-off in tiring out quicker but not much and you're gaining quite a bit in how well it will chop the heavier stuff Let's talk about the sheath a little bit. Um, some kind of a hard plastic. It's riveted together with hollow grommets, kind of like Kydex would be. It's not Kydex. It does not have a friction fit. In fact, it's kind of loose. Um, you can see it has plenty of points to strap it down to a backpack, to some kind of molly gear whatever. You got a lot of lashing points, you got a lot of strapping areas, comes with a strap. Uh, I've always thought that using a sheath, especially on a large knife, as a platform to attach pouches to carry survival equipment makes a lot better sense than say having a hollow handled knife. Uh, you got more area to store stuff you have easier access and you're not compromising the strength of your main tool. So with these hollow gr uh, grommets like you do on a kydex sheath, it's good spots to use a little paracord and lash, say a fire kit or you know, your mini kit, whatever. Uh, it's also a good spot down here, say, to anchor a piece of paracord and wrap around and store some extra cordage. Um, the sheath is ambidextrous. You just, the strap is Velcro. The uh, belt holder, the belt loop holder, is Velcro. So you just unzip it, flip it around, hook it back through. Um, the retention strap up here 
is held on with a Phillips screwdriver. You just undo that, flip it around, do it on the other side, bam. You've swapped it from being right hand carry to left hand carry. So it's ambidextrous, which as a lefty, I am very appreciative of. If you can make a sheath ambidextrous, it's a good idea. Because there are some of us out here who use our left hand. Um, like I was saying, the sheath's a little loose. You can see it rattling around. The point at the front of the guard corresponds with a big V-notch in the front of the sheath, at the mouth of the sheath, which helps kind of align it in as you put it, as you sheath it. Um, it's a little rattly down here. you got about a quarter inch movement down at the tip of the blade. Has a drain hole. Oh, hey, it has a drain hole. I didn't notice that. So if you accidentally fall in a river as you're crossing or whatever, it will drain water out. That's a good addition to have. I had not noticed that. Thank you, Tobin. <laughs> um, if you're going to be carrying this around like you're working in the yard, and you're not wearing it on your belt, this slips out easily enough that you need to be aware of it so that you don't accidentally have it slip out and cut your hand as it's doing so. There is no friction retention. So if you're going to be carrying it around, it's a good idea to use the retention strap. Um, other than that, I think it's a well done sheath. Ambidexterity is great. Um, okay, it's a cutting implement. Let's do some cutting. Uh, like I said before, it's a full flat grind with a secondary bevel that will cut through materials well. Uh, it does not have as sharp a blade as I would prefer, uh, but it's a good brush cutting edge. It's not made for fine cutting, but with a little bit of work you could get it there. So I haven't touched up the edge at all. This is as it came out of the box. We'll see how it does. We'll start with the thin whippier stuff. Um, if it's too heavy and it's moving too slow, it's not going to cut through that well. Let's see how we do. Okay. It didn't bounce those at all. So even though the edge is not hair shaving sharp, it's a very good brush cutting sharp. So we'll try some harder stuff. With it. Okay, a little bit heavier cutting. Uh, this is a cold piece of timber out of a crate that I salvaged. It's not going to be too much of a challenge, but it's a little more than the whippy branches. So we'll see what it does. I think I have all the nails out. Hopefully we're not going to have an unexpected nail cutting test. We'll see. And I'm not going to get overly vigorous with the cutting, but I'm just going to go at it fairly leisurely. Here we go. Oh, hey. Do you see how deep that bit? That did pretty good. I can't force it back in without swinging about quite as deep as it went. But that sank about that deep up into that pine two by four. Now here in Texas we don't have many softwoods. We have cottonwood. And I think that's about it. We have a lot of you know, mesquite, we've got oak, we've got uh, elm, red oak. red oak, various kinds of oak, uh, blackjack oak that will shoot sparks off of the chainsaw. Bodark. Bodark, also known as Osage Orange, Hedge, Thorn Apple, I think it's called Thorn Apple, Hedge Apple, all kinds of different names for it, but Osage Orange. Lots of hardwoods, not many soft ones. So typical cutting for me here in Texas would not be a pine two before. However, that is pretty impressive. I'm not even putting much effort into it, and it's cut pretty, pretty darn. Good. There we go. I didn't count the number of uh, hits. But that wasn't many. Edge is like it had been. Uh, with that little bit, there wasn't really much damage to the 
coating, just a little bit of scuffing, but any coating is going to take damage when you start using it. So, full flat grind with a uh, secondary bevel does a real good job of cutting all kinds of stuff. I'm a big fan of my forged blades. That's basically how they're done, except you know, they're forged down into that taper. They're not ground full length like this is. Eye proof. I'm going to hand the 14 inch model over to Tobin, who is currently being cameraman for me. And we'll turn him loose. Come? Yes. Okay. You sure? Yes. Oh my goodness. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I am strongly contemplating editing that out. That's pretty effortless. Huh. Yeah, see if we can find a chunk of mesquite. That's cool. Hang on, let's see. It's just a little like a little one inch round piece of mesquite. Let's see what it does. I think it's right to the heart of it. You're not even doing a full power swing. No, no, just Going at it leisurely. And this is mesquite. Too. Which is a hardwood if you're not from Texas or another place that has mesquite. It's not the hardest wood, but it's definitely not a soft wood. Doing some nice fine cutting. That really does a lot. that. <laughs> and what's the stump? Uh, the stump is very rotten, whatever it is. Yeah. It's very soft. I think it's like a form of elm, maybe. See, and look. And that's, that's barely putting anything on the blade. That's just letting gravity do most of the work. I gotta pick up a couple of those. <laughs> <laughs> Just to have. But but you forge your own. Yeah, but these are the kind you play with. <laughs> <laughs> you forge hard use knives. Yeah. But they, but they go for a little more than this. Exactly. For the price, that ain't bad. I'll talk about that here in a minute. That hit a knot, that's the only reason it didn't go all the way through. You're up to about an inch and a half thickness there? Yeah, they're about. <laughs> and that's only because I didn't swing as hard as I could, because I don't want to hit my hand. That takes a good bite. Okay, you haven't been working with it all that long. How's the texture of the handle feeling on your hand at this point? It's not bothering me. Okay. 
It's, I know it's there when I start thinking about it. It's not rubbing. It's actually a nice grip. The only thing, you do feel the weight. You start feeling the weight a little bit as you're doing smaller, finer cuts, finer hits. Now just bear in mind that I'm really out of shape, so that's why I feel it. <laughs> well, it is definitely much thicker stock than a standard machete. Yeah. It's also a lot sharper than a standard machete. It's just, it's built a little differently, and I think, personally, quite a bit better than your average machete. That is very nice. Go pick up a couple. All right, we're going to try something a little bit more uh, challenging. Not too bad, but give it a more typical workout. Uh, this is a mesquite branch that's been dead and laying for a while. If you've ever been around mesquite, you know that uh, when it's dead and laying on the ground, it tends to attract wood sawyer bugs. So it deteriorates pretty quickly if it's left out in the open where the bugs can get to it. But this, you can see how it's bouncing, it's still pretty solid. It's got a little bit of eating on it, but it's still a pretty good solid branch. That's about the size of my mid forearm. It's a pretty good, pretty good big round. Uh, this is fairly typical for what I would be cutting brush with, with a you know, machete or an axe or one of my bush swords. So we'll see if it does as well as I think it will. Uh, positioning's a little awkward on it. We'll see if we can get a good test done. Anytime you have wood bouncing like that when you're cutting, you're losing part of your energy. Thanks, Toby. We'll see if that can help. A bit of pretty good chunk. A good part of how well, how quickly you cut is your technique and not just the blade. Well, I've been cutting brush for a long time, so I'll be using a technique that works well for me at least. Basically, come in from one side, cut, come in from the other at about a 45, and you blast the chunk out. You just keep going back and forth, and it'll eat through the wood quickly. So. That was, what, four hits total? About. <laughs> about. <laughs> Look at the end of the wood. You see how much of that is heartwood, which is hard. That was not a particularly hard swing on any of those. Let's continue cutting. See if I can hold it. Don't get too close. thicker but a little more rot to the uh, sapwood on the outside. I think the heartwood's still pretty solid right there. That broke. But two hits were about halfway through. right down at the very tip of the blade. I just realized I haven't shot a video with me doing this much cutting with one of my own bush swords yet. <laughs> I need to. I have done a few cutting videos, but nothing this extensive with my own stuff yet. It's an inexpensive option, so you don't feel as bad. <laughs> that and I'm not about to pack this up and send it to someone. So I don't have to worry about the wood gum from being all over the blade. That's true. Which with the forge finish cleans up it quick. If you use a hundred grit sandpaper, it comes back looking like it was when it's new, but still. Usually when I'm doing one of these I'm just doing a quick little demonstration prior to shipping it off, so I need to be sure to shoot a video with my own work, doing a little more extensive cutting than what I've done.
Yeah, just like it was. Got a wee tiny chip at one spot. More of a little bit of an edge roll. I can just feel the wire a little bit. Not bad. Machetes tend to get notched edges pretty quickly. Um, this one, you can bring that back with a wet rock in just a few minutes. You can also keep working with it like that all day. Once again, there's a difference between something that's built for real fine cutting, say a hunting knife, that you want to hold that fine edge for a long time, and something that just needs to cut through brush. This is doing much better than I would expect any machete that I've picked up uh, to do without, you know, touching the edge first. Tremontinas are pretty good, but they don't come with as good an edge as what's on this. Or as good as steel. Or as good as steel. Um, a lot of them don't even come to an edge. They'll have something of a bevel and it's still very thick at the edge. There's no... the planes do not meet and make a point. So, this is significantly sharper than you're going to pick up your average machete and find it to be. We're going to talk a little bit about things that I would change and there's not a whole lot that I would. Uh, on the sheath, like I commented, it's kind of rattly. Even with the retention strap on, give me a moment. You're still getting about a quarter inch of movement down here at the end. Now, as I've built sheaths for big blades. I've built sheaths for big blades that swell as it gets to the end, and it's challenging. It's hard to get it to fit tight and still withdraw easily. However, with a sheath like this, if you just got your clearance a little tighter down here at the tip and left the rest of it a little wider, where it's not rattling quite that much, I think it would be an improvement. Um, as is, with it as loose as it is, it withdraws easily. You definitely want to make use of the retention strap when you're not one in your hand. Otherwise, it'll come out fairly easily. Uh, that's more a concern to me if you're walking along just holding the sheath and accidentally cutting yourself and the sheath slips off versus say it falling out while you're walking because you're going to have to be upside down before the, sheath, the blade's going to fall out like that. Uh, another thing I would change, I think it would be a good idea to have a finger notch up here so that you can grip up close more easily and do a little bit of fine work. The 18 inch model is not quite as good a candidate for that as the 14. I think the 14 would really excel for doing the big work and then also doing some up close fine work if there was a finger notch there where you could choke up a little bit. The uh, forward guard fits between your fingers real nicely so it would have been a good spot to put a finger choil in my opinion. And the finger groove would be the same size as the uh, tang. Yeah. So basically that nice wide radius that we saw put the same kind of thing right there. It'd be plenty strong. Good spot for your finger to go. Um, but most people in general are not going to be hacking their way through the South American jungle and with one blade and need, they need to do everything. So that's probably not as big a deal for your average user, but I could say if you're a power user, you would probably want to take a little section out right there with a belt grinder or something <clears throat> around the corner so that you don't, uh, the sharp edges of the corners don't dig into you. I make a little finger notch for doing some up close fine work. Uh, steel held up all right. There was a little bit of notching going on on this one, on the 18, when we were doing the bigger piece. Nothing too bad. Uh, like I said, you could keep working all day with that without worrying. 
I don't think mine would do that. I've never seen mine notch out quite like that, uh, chopping that much. But compared with what else is on the market, I think it did quite well. Um, Price. I haven't mounted. I'll get there. I haven't worked with it long enough to see if the handle's going to be a big problem. I'd have to work probably for a good half hour, hour and a half, chopping brush to start causing issues. Um, it's been a little while since I've done any brush cutting, so my hands don't have quite as much callus. They are callus, but not as much as they have been in the past. So I can feel it a little bit, not a whole lot. Um, you would be good for a, a while working with this handle if it would be something that would cause problems in a half hour I don't know yet I'd have to work with it longer overall I'm really curious who built this or who designed it they knew what they were doing they designed it right um, further testing is needed to know about the steel since that's an unknown question in my mind 1060 good plain medium carbon steel makes a good choice for a big chopper um, if this is pretty close to 1060 and they did a good heat treatment on it it'll do just fine no problem uh, the design is very much along the lines of what I would probably build um, I'd say that they they nailed it they did what they needed to talking about price the MSRP on um, these is approximately eighty dollars. I found these at knifecenter.com. I believe is the website. It's Knife Center. And I'm pretty sure it's knifecenter.com for forty something each. So almost almost half the MSRP. Part of the reason that I took the time to do this little review is because I see on various forums people going into big box stores and buying name brand, bl name brand blades. Uh, one in particular shares the name with a baby food company. Um, and it's crap. It's stainless steel, which is not a good choice for machete in general. There are some good stainlesses, but in general it's not that great of a choice. The, dis the quality of build from what I've seen, other people using it isn't that great. They had some problem with tangs breaking, yada, yada, yada. And the price isn't much different from this, if you get it certainly at a discount from its MSRP. Um, so I would say rather than spend your money on crap, if you're not going to buy a custom piece, the Kershaw Camp Series, Camp 18, Camp 14, I'm sure the Camp 10, it's going to be much the same. It's just a little bit different blade design, same handle and everything. You know, I think they're a very good choice for the money.